The phrase actually means, behold the man. And then round on the terrace, the top terrace, just past the telephone, there's a room called Eche Mata Tua, which means, behold your mother. We're also in a place that right down at the very bottom has a place called the Lephostritos, the standing pavement. Now those three things are unique to the Gospel of John. They're not in other Gospels. In order to talk about where these phrases are, which are part of the Joanite Passion, the only way is to start with some of the earlier part of the narrative. So this first section is going to be looking at some of the clues in John's Gospel that lead up to the Joanite Passion. And then the second session, we'll look more specifically at the Passion narrative. But because John is a narrative, we can't suddenly leap into uh, John 19 and 20 unless we've had a little look at what else is happening. So where do these phrases come from? What do they mean? Why did John write them when none of the other Gospel authors did? All the Gospel writers, as we know, are trying to come to terms with this question. Why did Jesus die? And every Gospel author has his own particular angle on why this event happened. And some of that's determined by the audience they're talking to. Uh, an audience in Rome is different to an audience in Antioch. If it's a Jewish community, that might be different to a community made up of Gentiles. So this question's go the way the question's answered will change uh, depending on the audience, the need, and also the possible time it was written. So John probably written late 90s, about 25 years after the destruction of Jerusalem and the temple. Evidence is it was written for a community that's a strong group of Jewish members, Jews, Samaritans, as well as Gentiles. So it's a very strong Jewish context. So some people need to ask the question historical, why did Jesus die? What did he say that was so outrageous that he was executed by Rome? Other questions then are, what theology, where was God in this death and resurrection? What was God doing? And that's a theological question, and that's always a question I'm most interested in, and I think the Gospel authors are. So why did Jesus die? What can we say about it? Now, in John, we get some wonderful clues in the prologue. The prologue is like when you go to a, an orchestral concert, often they play an overture, and the overture gives you one of the main themes musically that you're going to hear. Just get little snippets. Well, the prologue does much the same. By the time you finish the prologue, which is verses 1 to 18, you know the whole of the Gospel. You've been told all the answers you need. The narrative then shows you how what happens. So this is in the prologue. He came to his own, but his own did not receive him. That's the first part of the story. Jesus coming into the world of Judaism and many within that world of Judaism struggling. And we meet them in the narrative. Or old Nicodemus, uh, some of the uh, high priests, some of the Pharisees, but not all. Nicodemus himself was a Pharisee. To those who did receive him, remember, they're all Jews, they all those who did receive him, he gave them the power to become the children of God. This is the essence of John's Gospel. 
It's a gospel about becoming the children of God. The other gospels sometimes emphasise Jesus coming uh, to take away sin for salvation uh, or atonement theories. John's emphasis is this, to become the children of God. That's the first clue. Second big clue in the prologue is the word became flesh and dwelt among us. Now the word dwelt is what's important here. Because of the gospel, the original Greek, it uses a word skene. And that word skene is used in the Old Testament to speak of the tabernacle. Some translations even write the word became flesh and tabernacle. Or the word became flesh and pitched his tent, which is good. Okay. If your text says the word became flesh and lived among us, no, it's not good. It, try and capture that sense of the, the allusion to the tabernacle of the Old Testament. So here it is, an artist's impression. It's a bit like the Bedouin tent that we were in. That's all it was, a tent, a tent, covering the Ark of the Covenant. So that's in the prologue, that's a clue. When we come to the actual text, John 2, we get this scene in the temple that every other gospel says comes at the end, just before the Passion. John moves that scene to right at the beginning of Jesus' ministry. Now, it gives it then a very important symbolic significance. Let's see what he says. First of all, he calls the temple my father's house. Now, please remember that phrase. It will happen once more in the gospel. And when you hear it the next time, remember, you heard it here in chapter 2. And it named the temple my father's house. He's then confronted by the Jewish leadership group who say, give us a sign. What sign have you got for saying these things? And the only sign Jesus gives them is this phrase, destroy this temple, and in three days I will raise it up. And then the narrator explains. But before we read the narrator's explanation, just think, you've seen models of the temple. Can you imagine how crazy those words sounded? Jesus standing in the middle of this temple saying, destroy this temple, and in three days I will raise it up. The narrator then says, he spoke of the temple of his body. What's happening here is, Jerusalem's temple, and with it, their whole sense of where God dwells, because that's what the temple represents. The meaning of that is being transferred to the person of Jesus. So from now on, whenever we see the building, temple, we've also got to keep in mind Jesus is the new temple. Because it's happened here in chapter 2. This is brilliant artistry. This is wonderful artistry. In the middle of a building, destroy this temple, and in three days I will raise it up. When really, it's talking about his own body. 